bringing you another fine podcast from Art Report Today. My name is Michael Delgado, and I'm on special assignment for Art Report Today. My guest is Alexandra Terry. She's the chief curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art, Santa Barbara. And she's here to talk about a fantastic new show featuring the LA-based artist Genevieve Gagnard. It'll finally be reopening to the public on October 22nd, after having been closed in late March due to the pandemic. If you're unfamiliar with MCASB, I urge you to plan a visit as soon as possible. It's Santa Barbara's contemporary art jewel. MCASB is a premier non-collecting arts institution, and it's dedicated to the most innovative and compelling art of our time. It's got a rich history of putting on world-class exhibitions just like the current Gainyard Show. Their slate of programs for 2021 will certainly uphold that tradition. The museum is celebrating 45 years of delivering influential contemporary arts dialogue among artists, as well as with the arts community writ large. Way back in 1976, MCASB was founded as an alternative art space called Santa Barbara Contemporary Arts Forum. Early exhibitions included Craig Kaufman, John Baldessari, Lynn Folks, Ed and Nancy Keenholz, among many others. In the decades since, the museum has presented powerful shows from such luminaries as Vito Acconci, David Ireland, Joseph Kasuth, Erica Rothenberg, Dan Graham, and Michelle O'Mara, to name just a few. You can check out their impressive history, see images from the current show, as well as learn about their upcoming programs and other important info at mcasantabarbara.org. So it's with real respect and pleasure that I welcome Alexandra Terry. <laughs> Thank you for coming to the museum. I know. I well, it's gl- I'm glad that and you're reopening in a couple of weeks, right? Or no, next week. We're opening reopening Thursday, October twenty second. Yeah, and you've been closed since March thirteenth. Ouch. Yeah, we opened an exhibition on March fifth, and made the tough decision to close a week later, which was just days before the shelter in place orders. And um, we've been waiting for this moment for the yeah. last seven months. Well, that's good. And it's such a great show. Thank you. Um, it's a beautiful space, too. I, I like it here a lot. Um, so speaking of the show, and it's a great show. And um, it's, so how long does it get to be up now? We're so grateful that the artist and her studio and the gallery and all the lenders have been so generous with us. So it was originally meant to come down May 31st, and this will be the second time we've extended it, but it'll be up through the end of the year, so December 31st. And so what did that do to the rest of the schedule? Does it just push everybody back, or did you change things? We pushed things back. You know, we've gone through a few different cycles of making plans, which I've talked to you know, my colleagues in the field, and they're all kind of doing that. There comes a point where maybe you just kind of leave it open, but we've pushed um, pushed our exhibitions back, and it's also given us an amazing amount of time to reconsider a lot of our programming, both educational and exhibition programming. So we've tried to use our time wisely, mm-hmm. and we're just really thankful that everybody has stayed open to our shifting schedule. In these days of pandemic, shifting schedules is an understatement, of course. The disruption to our comfortable routines has forced us to not only rethink our priorities, but also to reflect on our own identities. Am I so truly defined by my job? What exactly defines the boundaries of my little quarantine bubble? Place and identity are central to Gainyard's work. The show includes several photographs for which he is best known, two installations never juxtaposed with one another, as well as new collages. All the pieces resonate in a very unique way at this very anxious time. We'll have pictures up on aggeiger.com, and there's, of course, much more on the mcasantabarbara.org site. But as chief curator, Alexandra is quite adept at walking us through the show virtually. The show is a group of works from 2016 to 2019. And yes, Genevieve has been really known for her photography. 
in which she is the subject of each photograph and yet she is representing a different persona in each each photograph so I find it interesting that many people don't recognize that it's her in every photograph mm. every time but so we have a series of photographs and like you said a few different installations and sculptural work and then we're really lucky to have a beautiful um, collage piece which was uh, is on loan from some lovely local collectors who are also big uh, supporters of the museum and it, interestingly uh, right before Genevieve's exhibition opened here, she had a booth, a solo presentation at Freeze through v her gallery, Vilmatter Los Angeles, where she showed some of her new collage work. And she really is kind of moving more in, in that collage uh, direction. But I'm really delighted that we have a wide cross section of her work here because she works so well throughout so many different medium media um, so we have in the middle of the space a big pink house and it's funny because the exhibition is called outside looking in and no one has been able to come in for you know so far <laughs> the duration of okay. the exhibition so everybody has been outside looking in at it um, so this big pink house holds within it two separate ex uh, sorry installations a bedroom installation and a bathroom which haven't been shown together previously but they work i'd say seamlessly together yeah i, I think you're interesting because it's almost like walking into one of her photographs absolutely and that's what's so fascinating about the installation work because it originated as a way to provide a sort of peek inside the inner psyche and the inner life of some of the persona and some of the characters in her photographs. So in certain pieces, um, photographs will be shown in juxtaposition with those room installations to, you know, ex contextualize like this is this is this character and this is what her living room mm -hmm. looks like. And it's really a commentary on the fact that we don't know what's going on inside of people, inside, you know, psychologically and within their home. And we make a lot of, you know, we make a lot of um, judgments based on people's outer appearance. Well, yeah, I mean, I think I, I take it like it's a lot of almost a, not a commentary, but it's appropriate in the time of the selfie where everything's curated, right? And so, um, like the room, she curated the room about a character, so it's sort of meta that way that it's really a selfie, but it's not because it's curated. So. Totally. And, and that relates to the title as well, Outside Looking In. You know, her work really explores this amazing um, cross-section of persona and identity and, and explores intersectionality. And so Genevieve is a, is a woman of color whose mother is white and her father is black. And um, she really is exploring the cross sections of her own intersectionality while giving us an opportunity to think about the multitudes that are within ourselves. And that that's really something to be celebrated and something to be curious about rather than to be afraid of or nervous about. But it's not always so easy to be completely empowered by all of these intersections within ourselves. So what's so beautiful about Genevieve's work for me is that she creates you know, opportunities for people to see themselves in her work. So for instance, the, the um, installation which is entitled Black is Beautiful, which is a bedroom, and on the bed is a series of Cabbage Patch dolls which are a, have a sort of like variety of skin tones. And you have an MC Hammer doll in the space, and you have a vintage record, vinyl record of The Wiz, and it's fascinating because in contemporary art there are very few opportunities for young black and brown women and men to see themselves reflected and to see their identity reflected in the in the artwork and 
So while Genevieve's work is incredibly layered and there are so many more elements to that particular piece, one of the immediate, uh, you know, opportunities there is is for people to see themselves where they may not otherwise. Hmm. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. that if, yeah, because they are such iconic things that are in the room, and yeah, you would have, yeah, I had one of those, or I didn't have one of those, or, yeah. And then in the, in the space right next to it, an installation called Be More. Um, it's a bathroom installation, and we see rows and rows of beauty products for black women. And there are hair straighteners and hair dye, as well as skin lightening creams and a soap called Virginity Soap, and a lot of products that seem sort of scary, potentially toxic, but clearly marketed to a very specific um, demographic. And she has hanging in this room hundred dollar bill towels so there's like this real commentary about while be more might be can be thought of as an affirmation it's also sort of an oppressive statement which is implying like you're not enough not enough yeah so you need to be more and i love the subtlety in with which she draws into question capitalism and and this notion of consumerism in terms of selling people the idea that they're not good enough. Mm -hmm. So black women not being European looking enough or not being white enough and needing to change their appearance to fit within that, which is clearly, you know, a prescriptive of the systemic racism in our culture, but also capitalism, you know, mm -hmm. which is just playing on those really insidious histories. Right. Yeah, no, it's a powerful piece. I, and again, you feel like you're walking into... It's intimate at once, but then because it's constructed and it's curated and there's you know clearly things being told, or a story being told, I should say, that so it's intimate, but it's not. And it's, it's, it's very strong that way. And voyeuristic. Right. You know, that's... Um, Outside looking in. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, clearly. And, and especially here in Santa Barbara, there's not a very large black population. So for sure, that's outside looking in. Definitely, and the exhibition sort of begins with an installation that is provided as an opportunity for those of us who are not people of color to see ourselves, to, to kind of put ourselves in the position. So there's a black mirror right when you walk into the left, which technically does not exactly reflect a black reflection back at you but conceptually the idea is you know can you imagine being in my place and can you imagine um so behind the mirror is a wallpaper of gibson girls so you know white women who were the ideal notion of beauty staring back at you so it's, in the turn of the in the turn of the century exactly exactly so creating that tension of being an outsider, not being accepted, you know. Or, right. Yeah. Because and she because she is she's very light skinned herself, right? And so Yeah. I mean that's an interesting part of the photography is that Genevieve is very fair and often people we haven't had this in our exhibition because we haven't been open to the public, <laughs> but Genevieve has shared with me that in, in previous exhibitions, including her f um, solo exhibition at the at CAM, the California African African American Museum, she would be in the space and overhear viewers say, "Who does this white woman think she is making, you know, commentary on living as a woman mm -hmm. of color, as a black woman?" So, you know, it's really fascinating. Um, that she puts herself out there and in that mm -hmm. a, in a, a position and for me her seeing her work has empowered me to really embrace the different elements of my own intersectionality and I feel like I've learned so much from her and working with her but also just being immersed in her work every day. Alexandra's own intersectionality involves a Persian heritage and a worldly view that has included an upbringing by counterculture parents in Boulder, Colorado, and then a lengthy stay in London before landing the gig in Santa Barbara. So I, I grew up in Denver, um, and my I grew up 
you know, my mother's a painter, right. and my father's a Renaissance man, but certainly um, an artist in many ways. And so I grew up with artists and musicians and in a, in a bit of a more alternative pocket of Denver. And I decided to study at CU Boulder, although I did come and do a visit to um, Santa Barbara. And now that I'm living here, I don't know why I didn't come to university here. <laughs> uh, because I don't ski. Right. <laughs> um, so I missed out on the joy of being you know, near the snow. But I studied film and photography at Boulder. Um, and I, I went to London to study abroad. And while I was there, had an amazing mentor who guided me towards curatorial practice. I um, knew I wanted to study abroad in London and I was really lucky that CU Boulder had a program at Goldsmiths College, which is part of the University of London. And I had a professor there who th said, you seem to know a lot about who's the director of what institution and who shows who and where artists, you know, have you thought about curating? And it was perfect timing because it was in this moment in my life where I thought, like, I'm not a practicing artist, but I this is my passion. So um, she introduced me to the, the curating uh, master's program at Goldsmiths, which I went to. That's what I, I yeah. remember that. And, that. and then, but then you stayed in London, right? I, lo I fell in love with London. I never thought I would move back to the States, honestly. And I was there, I was there for about 10 years uh, in total and was really lucky to find a job when I was in the second year of my master's degree and they ended up sponsoring my work visa which you know is not that easy to come by and um, I yeah I didn't foresee myself moving back to mm. the states but I came back to be closer to family so. right and did you move back to Denver I can't remember no I moved part. to Santa Barbara from London that's right yeah culture shock <laughs> big culture shock just a little yeah yeah it couldn't be much different much more different and then and okay and then I remember yeah so then you were gigging around and, yeah but then doing the Santa Barbara hustle for 18 months because yeah. I had no expectation that I would find a um, op an opportunity in my field not that they're I mean they're two you know they're amazing institutions here in Santa Barbara I mean for such a small you know small mm -hmm. in quotes a uh, small place there's an um, amazing amount of opportunity in the nonprofit field and, mm -hmm. and in fine arts but I just had this amazing opportunity fall into my lap and so I've been at MCASB since um, spring 2017 so oh, it's wow. only been a little over three years and and you but you've been behind some big shows then right since then I was so lucky to curate an exhibition during a time of transition um, in the institution and work with one of my sort of, I mean, heroes, that's a big word, but someone, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I hear Barry, Barry McGee might be one of my heroes, but someone who I have admired since, I don't know, 15, 14. And it was um, it was amazing, and it was an exhibition. I think that the community really was open to, and felt connected to. And this is the Barry McGee show. Barry McGee, yeah, that was in the summer of 2018. Huh, very recent. So pretty recent, and and that was fun. And Barry is a big surfer, and it was really important for him to pay homage to the deep surf culture and the roots of you know board shaping and Rennie Yater and this like these amazing figures that I of course knew nothing about <laughs> until Barry kind of swept into town but it was a really cool exhibition in that many people in our community saw themselves reflected in it mm. where as maybe they hadn't before so I, I really like that element of curating is like every exhibition is an opportunity for us to connect more deeply with a different group of people. I mean, obviously, like I said before, it's for everybody, mm -hmm. but we learn more about different parts of our history and different um, spaces in our city through each exhibition. 
Coming on the heels of the Ganyard Show is an exhibition by another artist that is exploring contemporary anxieties through different personas. Shana Moulton is perhaps best known for her performance work titled Whispering Pines, which was developed at the Kitchen, Harvest Works, and the New Museum. It then went on to tour art museums and performance festivals around the U.S. Only modestly aware of her work, I was excited to learn more, and I'm anxious to see the show. Alexandra gives us a primer. Shauna is a video artist, a sculptor. Um, she works in new media, and her exhibitions are immersive and experiential, which is going to be something interesting to navigate during a time like this. Mm. And um, but a lot of video work, and she has a recurring character named Cynthia in her in her work that is. A character that might explore some of Shauna's inner workings individually, but she's a bit of a hypochondriac and agoraphobic. And well, that's all very appropriate for now. Exactly. So I, I'm really excited because I feel, well, I know for a fact that Shauna will be touching on, not, um, you know, pointedly, but issues that have come up for all of us about fears around health and wellness and separation anxiety, isolation and um, you know the inner workings of the psyche during difficult times. Mm, that sounds fascinating, and that is when? So that will be happening in the new year. We don't know exactly when, but that is the planned, uh, the exhibition that's planned to open after Genesis. So first quarter 2020. Exactly. Alexandra and her team are also busy in the midst of a fundraiser. It's based on matching grants, so it's a fantastic opportunity to make your contribution go so much further. I asked Alexandra to tell us more. Okay, we're doing a fundraiser. Um, it's a matching campaign. So a few foundations, including the California Arts Council, the Roddick Family Foundation, and um, the Hutton Parker Foundation are matching funds to support our general operating costs, but really that goes towards our exhibition program or the education program that I've talked about a little. And so that will be going on for another couple of weeks. And if you're interested in donating, just um, you can visit our website and it's there's a, a button there for our perfect match campaign. And, you know, anything from a dollar on is so appreciated. And if you've been to the museum and enjoyed yourself, maybe you can consider donating something. As if putting on exhibitions and driving a fundraiser were not enough, the museum is also accelerating a very special program aimed at developing leadership in the arts by groups that have historically been underrepresented in positions of power. There's a, a program that I want to highlight, and that is one of the programs that donations from the fundraiser will go towards, which is our Emerging Leaders in the Arts program. And we're moving into our third year of this amazing year-long um, diversity arts pipeline. And it started as we received an amazing grant from the Ford Family and, uh, sorry, the Ford Foundation and Walton Fa Family Foundations as part of an initiative, um, Diversifying Art Museum Leadership Initiative. And we were one of 20 institutions in the States that received this amazing grant. And it, it has been an opportunity for young people. So in the first two years, it was for people between high school and post-grad who are interested in museum studies or curatorial to receive a mentor and have a very intensive year-long um, education program through the, uh, the museum learning about how to be a leader in the arts and learning about diversifying the arts and taking field trips to museums in the region and hearing from diverse voices in the field. So I, it's a, an amazing program that we are really pleased to continue with the help of, of donations, obviously. But I, I wanted to mention it because we're just about to start recruiting for that. And How many seats are there? So this year, um, it's going to be, a, there will be spots for three fellows. Wow. And those three fellows will be undergraduate students um, in Santa Barbara County. One of those students will be required to be um, in Santa Barbara City. 
And so we're starting to recruit. If anyone is interested in this program, has friends or family members who are interested, there's more information on our website. That sounds like a great program. And, and it's a year-long thing? Or? It's Well, this year will be nine months. You know, things are a little... We've so shifted it's things. It coincides with their normal school year? Then, yeah, or? it's it's. I think it will begin at the beginning of December. It kind of gives them a chance to settle into the school year. But it is extracurricular, and mm. so something that we'll be doing on Zoom this year and figuring out how to make it a virtual well, program. Well, that's too bad, yeah. Yeah. But... Very um, immersive and incredibly beneficial and the kind of program that I think, you know, so many people can benefit from. And this is called your Emerging Leaders? What is it? Emerging Sorry. Leaders in the Arts okay. or ELA. We refer to it as ELA. So, yeah, there's more information on our website and on our Instagram. We've been posting a lot about this program and other educational programs. And your Instagram handle is? At MCA Santa Barbara. Excellent. All right. Anything else? No, I think that's it. Well, excellent. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. You've been listening to me, Michael Delgado, on special assignment for Art Report today. My guest has been Alexandra Terry, Chief Curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art, Santa Barbara. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Art Report Today. Find your inspiration in the arts every day at artreporttoday.com.